think when we think of routine habit behavior change, we have to first understand that this is an identity level change that needs right. to happen first. You know, if it's the gym, I'm the, I'm the type of person who doesn't like the gym. I'm the type of person who is afraid of the gym. I'm the type of person who is inconsistent. We have to start rewiring that till I am an athlete. I'm the type of person who takes care of my body. I'm the type of person who watches what I eat. So much of it is identity level. Tell me a little bit about your early story and what's brought you to where you are today with the podcast and everything else you're doing. Yeah, I, uh, I was raised by my mom and my grandmother, so I didn't necessarily have a positive male role model in my life. I didn't meet my dad until I was 27, so that's definitely part of my story, and I think that's where a lot of the chip on my shoulder has come from, so that's definitely an important part. But for me, I job hopped when I was young from job to job. I didn't go to college because I knew it wasn't for me. And I just didn't really know what I wanted out of life. So I didn't want to spend money going to college just to figure out what I wanted to do. But in my mid-20s, I ended up getting a really good job. Um, that job led me to making six figures. And while everything seemed amazing, internally, I was very unhappy. I was depressed. I was anxious. I was, I didn't have any passion or purpose to life. So I assumed more money would fix all of my problems. And I ended up making more money and still sitting on the edge of a bed debating suicide because I just felt so stuck. I felt so trapped. I didn't have any way out. I didn't know what to do. And I started a podcast shortly thereafter, ended up leaving my job due to some of the advice I had been given by one of my close friends and mentors. And then I became a broke entrepreneur, very broke entrepreneur for the first three years. Um, but luckily we've made it to where we are and we're quote unquote successful now. But there's been a lot of, to, to Michael's point, there's been a lot of mental health challenges there's been a lot of depression and anxiety and just looking in the proverbial mirror and saying, I don't like who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I learn more about this? How do I become more confident? I think people see external results and they don't necessarily correlate the internal work that's had to happen in order for that to take place. So my goal is definitely to, to talk about that more than the success, honestly. Looking back, you know, was there ever a point where things either turned for the better that you can isolate and pinpoint and say that was that was a life-changing moment or experience and or i guess another question to go along with that is what was the source of the anxiety did you ever um isolate what that was and and how it came about for you yeah i had a i had a moment where this was a couple of years probably two or three years before i really had that suicidal thought when i was at work where my girlfriend and everybody were out and I was at home alone and we lived with this, this other couple in Boston. We had this really nice apartment, this three bed, uh, this three story apartment. It had cameras and it was just brand new, really nice. Again, it looked like I was crushing it. Everybody mm -hmm. was gone for the day and I was sitting in the loft. We, our bedroom was on the third floor. And I remember thinking, I think I was playing Call of Duty and then I just, I stopped playing. And I remember thinking to myself, if this is what life is, I don't want to do it. It's just dark. It's dull. It's plain. It's, I'm, I'm just sick of this. I'm sick of this existence. I feel like I'm missing something. That night when my girlfriend came home, I told her and she said, I think you should go to therapy. I really think you should go to therapy because I think there's something going on that you're not necessarily recognizing. So I ended up going to therapy and I found out that I had depression, I had anxiety, and I had some, some forms of PTSD from my childhood. I don't know if it was, I don't have like a specific knowing exactly when. I don't know if it's because my dad left and what transpired from there. So yeah, I definitely became aware of where it came from, but I never understood what anxiety was. I didn't know what depression was. I remember I had a girlfriend in high school and she, she dealt with depression. And I said, can you explain it to me? Like, I don't get it. Like what, you just feel sad or, and she tried to explain it. And I ended up figuring that out years later. So that was that part of it. I think when things turned for the better, it's when I left my job. I really do think that because part of my job was I was living on the road. So the year I made the most money, I was on the road for 10 months out of the 12 months living in hotels because we work so much on the road. And that just takes pieces of you that you don't realize. Like I used to stay up for 24, 36 hours routinely. That was just normal behavior. It didn't, and I would go to the gym. So I think that all the anxiety and burning the candle on both ends was right. just so negative for me and my mental health that when I left that job, although I was becoming broke quickly, I actually was proud of what I was doing every day and I felt like I was making progress. So I would say the best thing, the the most positive shift was when I left that job and said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try to figure out this podcast thing. Yeah. And I want to, I want to dive a little bit deeper just into, you know, suicide, but also the, the symptoms or the factors that 
often accompany that or lead up to that for for the people whose lives it touches. Um, and I've one of the things that I've struggled with in my past has been anxiety and specifically panic attacks, mm -hmm. um, which I guess began I don't know sometime around probably my mid twenties. Uh, I just turned thirty one now, so definitely been dealing with that for at least a half decade. Um, and what I found for me, Kevin, and would love to hear your, your take on this um, from your perspective. Uh, the way I think about panic is the manifestation or the materialization of built up stress plus anxiety over time, which to your point, at least for me, came about as a result of just, you know, a part, I'd say equal parts confusion about where I was in life, um, confusion about where I wanted to be anger or frustration about not being there. And then also just overwhelm with all of the different things that, that I felt like I was dealing with or that I was dealing with at the time. And um, it never got to the point where, you know, I was contemplating, you know, actually going in that dark of a direction, but I was certainly having thoughts, which is something I think everybody can relate to that, that were dark in nature. And, you know, I would think about it, like if there was a, an out button that I could just press right now, would I press it and just be ejected? Like those types of thoughts which which are not uh higher vibrational or positive or anything like that obviously um any thoughts on on any of that yeah it's interesting i don't i think part of it for me was like the depression and the anxiety was either the chemical imbalance or just my past right because i never started having i had panic attacks too and i never had a panic attack or anxiety attack whatever it's considered until i was so far outside of my comfort zone that I was constantly living in, living in anxiety. I actually did a summit this morning and I showed this chart of the comfort zone, the learning zone and the anxiety zone. Mm. And what I told everybody was, I was an, an early entrepreneur who was very broke. One of the things I did was I went down to Florida to meet up with a mentor, a mentor of ours. And I hate planes. Traveling gives me anxiety because of my old job and all the associations I have with that. So traveling for me is already anxiety provoking. Meeting new people, anxiety provoking. And then we ended up going from Florida to Arizona to a Brendan Burchard event, which a giant room of 3,500 people is the most anxiety provoking thing in the world. So when we were in Florida, before we left, I was so anxious, I started having panic attacks. And I had no idea what that was. I texted my mom and I called my mom and I said, I think I'm having an asthma attack. Like I think, I literally think I'm dying here. Yeah. Come to find out it was anxiety. What I think happened to me was I was so far in my anxiety zone, AKA stretching the rubber band to the point of breaking, I just didn't realize it. So this is interesting. My business partner is one of the most capable humans I've ever met in my entire life. And he's in incredibly intelligent. He works, his work ethic is second to none. I was trying to keep up with him. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had to be as smart as him. I thought I had to be as productive as him. And truthfully, I wasn't capable at that time. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't capable. So I think I worked myself so hard, so often for so long that I actually created that anxiety within myself. I really, yeah. really do because Fast forward a year and a half, we ended up going out to California for an event and I was fine because I, I was more competent. I was more capable of a human being. So in a way, I think my experience might be a little different than others where I wonder how much of that was just me grinding my face off and not recognizing that my mental health was taking a dip because of it. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Almost like, you know, almost like burnout in a way. Just constant, like, yeah, constant burnout. You know, I went from, I'm a kid who has no confidence. And like no self-belief to we're going to um so we lived in massachusetts and there was this party down at cape cod and it was like a mansion party where you had to have a you had to know the password to get on the island it's like i don't understand how i'm here i'm so anxious about meeting new people do i belong we're interviewing celebrities and and pillars of the self-improvement industry and it's like this it's just this amount of of stress and fear that my body just couldn't handle at the time right yeah, and I kind of want to go back to something you mentioned, you know, about the breaking through from, you know, the comfort zone into a bit of the anxiety zone and then breaking through to, to the learning, uh, to the learning phase. I think that, you know, um, there, there seems to be a, a level of uncomfortability with discomfort, right? Not to say the obvious, but um, almost like a stigma or a taboo about, about leaving that zone because inherently what accompanies that journey is going to be some anxiety and you're going to feel like you you're going to feel a bunch of unfamiliar feelings as you do that um what advice i guess would you share with people about 
finding the strength and the willingness and the motivation to push oneself through challenging or difficult change that feels scary while they're doing it. One thing I would say, and I want the listeners to think about this during this episode too, be careful who you're taking advice from because my, this is my comfort zone, right? I've done between my show and other shows, I've probably done 1400 episodes. This is my comfort zone right. and not probably not even my learning zone at this point, which is, which is interesting, but you have to understand that a lot of the advice we're given mm -hmm. is based on people who are very, very, very high in self-belief. And they're saying, get outside your comfort zone, do stuff that scares you. Yes, but it has to be measured within your current capability. So this is one piece of advice I would give, and I'll tell it with a story. I had somebody reach out to me and she said, I want to be a speaker like you. I said, cool. I love that. That's awesome. Let's figure out how to get you speaking on a scale of one to 10. How outside of your comfort zone is it for you to do a Facebook live right now? Mm -hmm. She said 12 out of 10. Okay, cool. On a scale of one to 10, how outside of your comfort zone is it for you to record a video and show nobody? And she said, that's like a one. I said, all right, cool. On a scale of one to 10, how outside of your comfort zone is it for you to record a video and send it to me only? And I won't show anybody. And she said, probably like a five. So think about that. The zero fear is comfort zone. The 12 is anxiety. The five is right in the learning zone. So the advice I would give is you have to make sure that it's in your comfort zone, your learning zone and your anxiety zone, because a lot of people who are giving advice forget what it was like to be a beginner. They might forget what it was like to have anxiety. So I think that's an important part of it. And you have to believe it will be worth it. You have to figure out a way to, to talk to yourself and say, well, what would life be like if I felt comfortable doing blank? Mm -hmm. If I could show up to an event and start a conversation with a stranger, how would that be worth it to me in my future? Because humans must have three beliefs to take a new action. It's human. You must believe it's humanly possible. It's possible for me and ultimately it will be worth it. And I think the, the worth it part is something that people get stuck up on because they don't necessarily know that it will be in the long run. So you have to, you have to explore that. What would make it worth it if you don't feel it is? Yeah. And, and there's a nuance there that I want to pull out as, mm. as a nugget to dive into for a minute too. And, and that is that as you, as you work through these higher levels of discomfort, uh, maybe of some fear, anxiety, stress, all of these things that we've been talking about, what's going to happen is you're going to change as a person, right? And what once felt scary and uncomfortable or like a 12 out of 10 on the fear scale is going to recede. It's going to go down and it's going to start to feel normal and even exciting and invigorating. I know I felt that way with going live and doing some of those, those things where I was putting my face out there and um, working to build my own you know, public persona, so on and so forth. Um, and I think that that goes for anything. That goes for sports, that goes for you know, competing, that goes for business, all of these things. As we, as we start to see some success, and for me, as I've created evidence for myself to fall back on like, okay, here's evidence to support the belief that, that this is possible and that I'm good at this and that I can be better at this if I nurture it, um, that will start to happen. And it's just a matter of consistency, of time, and I think of, of continued inner work to be willing to push along a path of discomfort until we reach that point of breakthrough where, where learning can happen. I love that word you used, evidence. Yeah. I love that. I'm, I'm always thinking the most recent and relevant evidence. What is the most recent and relevant evidence that points us in the direction we want to go? Now, the problem is at the beginning, you don't have that evidence yet. So you've got to hang on to that. See, I might have a, so I did a summit this morning and it was the first speaking engagement I've done in a minute because we we're just doing so much podcasting and coaching that there hasn't been a lot of time, yeah. but this is the interesting part. I did it right here. It was a virtual summit. The most recent relevant evidence I have of how well I'm going to do is I recorded three podcast episodes last night. I'm gonna be fine. I did this last night. I do this every day where if it was an on stage speech, my most recent and relevant experience is five months ago. So that's going to be a little bit different. My, my level of confidence, it's going to be more outside of my comfort zone because I have less recent relevant evidence. So along with recency and relevancy, um, let's talk for a minute about routine and consistency. So talk about the value in developing those consistent practices, turning those into habits over time. And then what happens along the long haul as we consciously commit to those changes that we make in our lives. So the analogy I always use for this, Michael, is maybe you can do them. I cannot do the splits currently, right? If I try to do the splits, we'd be in trouble and we, I would be in trouble. Physical pain, I don't know what would happen. But right. if I decided, you know what? Every day for the next 365 days, I'm going to practice the splits. I'm willing to bet by this time next year, I'd be able to do them. 
And I think it's probably that way for most human beings. But if I did it once a week, I'm only going to do it 52 times. If I did it once a month, I'm only going to do it 12 times. If I take weekends off, it's not going to be the same result. The, the importance of consistency is such a deep thing because not only will you get more productive output, but you'll get better each time, therefore being able to multiply your productive output because you're a more competent human being. You'll also learn things that will help you do it better, faster, and more efficiently. Consistency is the name of the game because without consistency, you can't really win because you're not leveraging the numbers. So there's the, Darren Hardy has this in his book, The Compound Effect. It's yeah. the, uh, the magic penny. It doubles every day. So a magic penny, it, it goes from one cent to two cents, to four, to eight, to 16, to 32, 64, 128, By the 31st day, I think it's something like $10 million. But if you miss one of those days, that number is drastically lower. Yes. Especially in the middle and the end, especially in the middle and the end. I mean, in the beginning, it's not, you know, it's, it's different, but that, that's the importance of it. When we talk about routine, I think that what you, what we need to understand is you tend to do what you've always done because that's how humans are built. We do the thing that we do, right? We, when we think of routine, this is a wonderful way to look at it. You're digging into your own identity and you're saying, I am the type of person that does blank. For a long time, Michael, I am the type of person who hammers into Dunkin' Donuts every day and I'm gonna spend $14 on a coffee, two breakfast sandwiches, and hash browns because those hash browns are darn good Make it part, of your identity. part of my identity yeah i'm the type of person who likes dunkin donuts i'm the type of person who gets coffee on the way to the studio and mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that necessarily like do your thing but that affects my routine so i recently had this realization that i was getting some time anxiety around my morning workouts because my first call sometimes starts at nine in the morning. I'm getting home from the gym at like seven. There's not enough time for me to do my back office work. So I changed my routine and I said, I'm gonna get up at 4.30. I'll be at the gym by five. I'll be home by six, 6.30. Move my calls till 10, boom, plenty of time. Now, my alarm went off this morning and I was like, I do not wanna do this. Boom, I am the type of person who gets up when his alarm clock goes off. I get up, went to the gym, my day has been amazing. So I think when we think of routine, habit, behavior change, we have to first understand that this is an identity level change that needs right. to happen first. So we got to figure out, um, you know, if it's the gym, I'm the, I'm the type of person who doesn't like the gym. I'm the type of person who is afraid of the gym. I'm the type of person who is inconsistent. We have to start rewiring that until I am an athlete. I'm the type of person who takes care of my body. I'm the type of person who watches what I eat. Well, so much of it is identity level, but it's hard. It's very hard to change that, right? Like no social media post is really going to help with that. This is like the deep work that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. And I found, especially with like lifestyle changes and those types of routines, um, you have to make the decision like before the actual moment that you have to make that change. So like if you're committing to waking up when your alarm goes off at 4 30 in the morning, maybe this is just me, but like, I have to come to that realization and commitment, you know, days or weeks before in deep meditation or in a moment of epiphany where I feel feel it deeply in my heart that that's what I need to do in order to achieve my goal. It's not enough for me to actually make that decision when the morning the yep. my alarm is going off because it's too easy to just tap it and shut your eyes again. Yep. Um, I'm actually really interested in in the specifics of your day to day and like how you structure your your days, Kevin. Um, does that look the same on weekdays and weekends? And how committed are you to? And what does your routine look like on a day to day? Yeah, so um, Monday through Monday through Saturday, I'm forward facing. So like I'll do I'll do podcast episodes on Saturday. I'll do coaching calls on Saturday. Sunday is a behind the scenes day, so nobody can get a hold of me. I will not do interviews. I don't do calls. So my alarm goes off at four thirty. I leave the bedroom. Usually the cats follow me. I shut the door so my wife can sleep because they get a little rambunctious in the morning. Uh, I head to the gym immediately. So my morning routine is I get out of bed. I splash my face with water, I get into my gym clothes, and I'm in the car. Okay. Usually, depending on the day, I'll either listen to music on the ride to the gym, 15 minutes, or I'll listen to a book. Depends on my mood, depends on my lift, depends on what's going on. I do 15 to 20 minutes of mobility at the gym with a book on. Then I go music mode, lift. Uh, usually do 20 minutes of cardio after my hour lift, head home, shower, and then I'm in the studio. So really, my morning is like sacred me in the gym time. And then from like seven to nine or 10, depending on the day, I'm doing back office work. So I'm replying to WhatsApp, uh, I'm sending pricing out, um, I'm doing the things on my to-do list that must get done. And then from 10 to six, 
I'm forward facing. So today, for example, I had a summit at nine. I had a podcast at 11. I was on like four or five shows today and I did a summit. So that's like an average kind of day for me. Like I do a lot of other interviews, coaching calls. I'm on probably, I don't know, 20, I don't know, including team calls. I'm probably on 35 to 40 calls a week. Wow. So I'm very much here, but number one, we're virtual. Our entire team is virtual. We don't go to a studio. My office, my home office is the studio. So that's good. And I shut it off. Like when I'm done for the night, I'm done for the night. I'm not checking my phone. So our kind of design is 80-20. So 80% of the time I'm working, 20% of the time I'm r and ring So if you think of it, if you sleep eight, eight hours a, a night, you have 16 hours of working time. 16 hours, 10% of that is 1.6, so times two, so 20% would be 3.2 hours. If you think about it, three, three hours is a long time for r and r right? Imagine that from basically six to nine every night. So that's pretty much where I'm at. It usually isn't 20%. I'm probably running like 90, 10, honestly. I'm probably getting like, you know, one and a half hours of R&R every day. And then Saturday is like a half day. I'll usually work like, I'll get up at 4.30 and do everything, but I only work until like one or two. Because I know my, my wife is a trooper and she's the most supportive human being in the world. Uh, but obviously like Saturday and su Sunday is a family day always. But Saturday she likes to do things too. So I want to make sure I'm available to her. Yeah, I, that's really helpful insight. So much has been made, you know, lately about morning routine and structuring your your morning and your day for optimal performance. So I think that's a great insight into kind of how you, how you look at your days and then your weeks from micro to, to, to macro. Uh, at least on like a weekly basis, super helpful. Um, what are some things with, with that in mind that you feel like maybe hold people back uh, either consciously or unconsciously from uh, being them their best selves or from actually committing to life-changing habits that will compound in positive impact over time? It's interesting because I thought most people were afraid of failure until I started coaching people and, and learning about people, a lot of people are subconsciously afraid of success. success. Yeah. And I never like, that's, I want to be successful. That's like, that's what I'm doing all this for. My biggest fear is not, not being a success. But I think that the depths of that is this many, many people are afraid of being alone and, or leaving people behind in the journey, which continues down. If you keep digging, 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 many people are struggling and subconsciously holding themselves back because of the people around them. One of my favorite questions in the world, and really think about this. This is an impactful question if you if you sit with it. Are the people in your life the best from your past or the best for your future? Did you used to go to college? You used to party? You used to go to the gym? You used to do this? You used to do that? Or are these people in your life because you're optimizing for your future? One of the reasons, I'm convinced of this, that many people don't accomplish their goals is because they would rather keep the people in their lives than accomplish their goals. Mm -hmm. Or keep the people in their lives at the same capacity. I'm not telling you you have to cut out your family. That's, that's a personal decision. That's up to you. What I am telling you is it might be worth reallocating time with people who don't fill your cup. It's definitely yeah. worth reallocating time for people who crap on your dreams, yeah. right? Like that's not fair to you. That's not fair to you. So that's one huge piece. The other piece is people, many people have low self-worth. Well, let's, let's say this. People's self-worth understanding is off. So either their self-worth is way lower than it should be or way higher than it should be. If somebody has an overshot on self-worth, they might get entitled and think they're, they should succeed no matter what, when that's not the truth. Somebody who is undershooting their self-worth, they might believe they're not the type of person who could ever be successful when that's not the truth. You know what the through line is, Michael? And I think part of it is you got to make sure you're doing the work, obviously. It's the internal stuff. One of the reasons people aren't more successful is because they assume doing all the external stuff will ultimately bring them success when sometimes it's the inner work that allows us to understand the value of the outer work. 100%. Yeah. 100%. That's what I would say. One of, one of my favorite sayings, and I have this tattooed on my body, is that each, each level demands a new you. And it's a, a short, simple quote, but the essence of what it stands for and the way that, that I choose to embody that and interpret that is just what you described. You know, the, the people, the places, the beliefs, the the values even, everything um, that may have characterized the way you lived your life even a year ago, let alone a decade ago, 
is no longer going to be, I mean, 99.9% .9 sure, going to be aligned with the person that you're becoming if you're on a self-improvement, personal development trajectory. Um, and it's about constant evolution to newer and higher levels. It's impossible that there's going to be congruence between the person you were versus the person you are awakening into. And a lot of that for me was catalyzed by a personal spiritual awakening journey that that helped to reshift my beliefs around that. Mm. Um, but I think that's really, really critical. And I'm glad you brought that up. Well said. I'll add yeah. this quickly, just as a, a visual. I want you to imagine that if you were to think of just think of uh, two hot air balloons. And again, I'm not saying that everybody isn't intrinsically valuable. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying when it comes to your potential, if your potential is different than somebody else's desired potential, mm -hmm. things are going to happen. So if you picture two balloons that are on the same level and one says, you know what? I want to get a little higher. I want to get a little higher. I want to get a little higher. But here's the thing. There's a rubber band connected between the two balloons. What's going to happen is eventually one balloon will raise to the point where the other one pulls it down. It keeps it steady. You can pull the other balloon up if you're strong enough or the rubber band is going to snap and you have to decide, am I willing to pull people up with me? That's awesome. And that's virtuous but it might hold you back. Success can be hard enough on your own. Are you willing to be held back by that rubber band or are you willing to potentially snap that rubber band? That's a question that you have to sit with yourself and, and figure out what's best for you and your journey and where you are in life. Yes, thank, thank you for sharing that analogy. Of course. That's, that's really great. Um, as we kind of close up here, let's switch gears slightly. Um, I really want to talk about your business and where you're at right now with Next Level University. Um, sure. So talk to me about I guess the genesis of that idea and then kind of what you're looking at right now in terms of your focus and then where you're looking to scale and grow for the future. Yeah, it's interesting because when we started this, we were just two kids who wanted to have a podcast and the genesis of the business was really how do you make money with a podcast? Mm -hmm. And Alan and I, my business partner, we had a conversation and it was like, well, we talk about self-improvement. So I guess the only logical thing would be to do coaching, right? And that was where we started. I started coaching people for free zero dollars an hour and it got to the point where i would just say hey i can't do this for free anymore what do you think of 50 dollars a week and boom 50 dollars a week 75 dollars a week 100 dollars a week and that's really where it started for us and it started from a place of value how do we give away as much value as humanly possible that really was our idea and our goal and that's the way we still run our business to this day what we're doing now is we're very much focusing on bigger things so we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. We have group coaching. We have courses. But we want to do more live events and like retreats because I think those can be very, very transformational based on the vibe and the emotions in the room. So that's something we're focusing on right now. We're actually in... We're, we have an app, but we're in production to continue improving it and make sure it's getting better and better by the day. So that's another thing that we're doing to scale. Um, but for us, the beautiful thing is we have the biggest part of our business as the podcast. And I mean, a podcast is one of the most scalable things in the world. So our business is set up very, very, very strong where every time we get more listeners, we bring mm -hmm. people into our business. And the beautiful thing is, Michael, there's a lot of places for people who don't want to pay. I mean, we have, I think we have 26 layers to our business. Half of them are free. Half of them are paid. So like, if you don't, if you don't have a, a financial stability feeling right now and you feel like I'm scarce, listen to the podcast. We have free virtual events. Right? We have free podcasts every week. Mm -hmm. We have a free course. So yeah, it's set up where I don't just want to help somebody if they can pay me. I want to help somebody no matter what. They may never become a quote-unquote customer. That's okay. I, I want impact. Impact first. The more people you impact, the more people you change their lives, you help them change their lives. That's how you you multiply your impact. And then the finances will follow eventually, and that's okay. Agreed. And I think you know, with a, with a content first business, this is something that I talk about a lot on the show um, for my monologue episodes. Um, the thing that, that, you know, is really important for people to understand is the importance of giving away free value upfront in excess to the point where you've injected so much goodwill for the business, but also for your followers, subscribers, and potentially prospective clients down the road. Um, that when the time comes that that person is ready to make an investment or to join the community in a paid capacity, like they're so comfortable, primed, trusting and ready to go that everything you've 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 given up to that point provides that foundation where you're no longer necessarily in a selling environment. You're more just in an introductory um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, bringing them bringing them into the right the right program or the right product for them and it's yeah. a much easier um journey for yeah for 
The problem with many businesses, particularly in like our, our area and our genre, is it's either you listen to the podcast or you give me money. And that's just not, it's not sustainable because the vast majority of people are never going to give you money. And honestly, they shouldn't. Not if that's the way you do it is, you heard this episode, give me money. There has to be, this is always my frame. Where do people go from here? So when they listen to our episode, where do they go? Okay, after that, where do they go? Where do they go? Where do they go? And it better be getting more valuable every time. It better be getting more valuable every time they move down the business. So a lot of people aren't aren't deciding to do it that way. And again, maybe they're not optimizing for the same thing. But I do believe that's one of the reasons that we are as successful in business as, as we are. And again, there's two of us, right? So Alan's out probably coaching right now. I'm out here adding value and, and spreading the message. So that's another piece too, is there's two of us and we're very consistent human beings, which helps. Amazing. And before I let you go, Kevin, uh, what is one thing, maybe your, your biggest takeaway that you want to leave people with, or the biggest thing that you're seeing right now, you know, in, in our society when it comes to um, mental health or personal development um, or growth? Uh, this is something we have our finger on. We have our finger on the pulse of this. For a long time, people were saying, grind your face off, don't sleep, work until, you know, work your hands to the bone, whatever. Yes. Then I think we swung to, it's all going to work out. It's all going to be fine. Only work when you want to work. Just try your best to figure out what your in-between is. I'm not of the mind that things are just going to work out for us all. I don't believe that. If if it worked that way, 75% uh, of podcasts wouldn't fail and more businesses would succeed. If it was going to work out, if it's all going to work out, I think that you have to make it work, but it doesn't mean you have to work all day every day. So I would say when it comes to mental health and physical health and emotional health and spiritual health and relationship health, make sure you're figuring out what your, I don't want to say balance. What's your equation? Mm. What does your equation look like? Make sure that you're on the correct end. There's many people who are working too much and they're burning themselves out. There are other people on the other side who aren't getting results and they're not sure why. Maybe it's because they're not doing the right thing. So make sure you're balancing productivity and mental health, holistic health. I would say that. Yeah. And as you find the right equation for yourself, each of those areas that you just alluded to, I think will naturally become even now and they'll start to they'll start to talk they'll start to bend to bleed over and to benefit one another mm. so improvements in sleep and downtime and r and r yep. will have carryover benefits in terms of productivity and work and creativity and um i love the way that you describe that so that's and that becomes a necessity at some point that's the interesting thing is when you do it right you have so much work that you have to r and r because if you don't yeah. r and r you can't perform right. and and this is the la and last thing i'll add just remember it's okay to hit the boundaries. Like, so I did, I did 90 episodes in 30 days and I burnt out. It was too much. Like that's just way too much output for me. I couldn't handle it. My, I lost my voice. I was burned down. It was terrible. But I also remember what it was like to do one coaching call a day when that would burn me out. Mm -hmm. So I've seen, I know both ends of this. This is not a challenge. This is anxiety zone to our point earlier. What's the middle? And to Michael's point earlier, that the equation is going to change as you get more competent. Yes. Five coaching calls might be impossible right now, but eventually that might be your easiest day and that's okay. So yeah, know yourself, know yourself. A hundred percent. Kevin, thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure, Michael. You're a, you're a, a good, a good human, very self-aware. This was a pleasure. You as well. Thanks so much, man. Of course.